Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, really digging into the core of IT support. Yeah, the essentials. Exactly. Think of this as your fast track, you know, to grasping key tech know-how and some smart troubleshooting techniques. Mm -hmm. We've got a great set of um, practice questions here pulled straight from the CompTIA Plus 220-1202 exam material. Which is a big one for people starting out in IT. It really is. It covers, well, everything from hardware to software glitches, security, problem solving, the works. Right. And the exam itself, it's timed, isn't it? Like 90 minutes. Yeah, 90 minutes, up to 90 questions. And they throw different things at you, multiple choice, drag and drop, even performance-based stuff. Yeah, those hands-on simulations. But look, our goal today isn't really about prepping for the test pressure itself. No, it's more about the underlying knowledge. Right. We're going to pick apart these questions to pull out genuinely useful stuff, things you can actually apply. We want to spark those uh, aha moments, you know, make tech feel a bit less daunting. Absolutely. And these practice questions, they're so valuable because they mirror the real world problems IT support pros face every single day. Mm. So by looking at them, we don't just find the right answer, but more importantly, we understand why it's the right answer, the principles behind it. Builds that practical foundation. Exactly. For tackling all sorts of tech challenges. Okay, let's jump into the first one. Picture this. A user's frantic. Their Windows laptop hits them with a user profile cannot be loaded error when they try to log in. Oh, yeah, that's a common one. And a frustrating one. Totally. So the question asks for the first step. Options are A, reinstall Windows entirely. Well. B, Boot into safe mode, create a new user account, C, replace the hard drive, or D, run disk cleanup. Okay, well, right off the bat, a couple of those seem excessive for a first step. Yeah, like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, right? Yeah. Reinstalling the OS. That's the nuclear option. It takes ages. And if they don't have good backups, yeah. poof, data gone. Definitely not where you start for a profile issue. And replacing the hard drive seems a bit hasty. Very premature, yeah. A profile loading error usually smells like software, not necessarily hardware failure right out of the gate. What about disk cleanup? Good for general tidiness, sure, but fixing a corrupted user profile, highly unlikely. Okay, so that leaves us with option B, booting into safe mode and creating a new user account. Why is that the recommended first move? Well, the beauty of safe mode is how it starts Windows. Yeah. Just the bare essentials, the core drivers and services. Right, stripping it down. Exactly. This often lets you sidestep whatever corruption is blocking that original profile. And crucially, safe mode usually gives you admin rights. Ah, which you need to create a new account. Precisely. So you set up a new, clean profile. The user can log into that, get back into their system, access their files, hopefully, and keep working, at least temporarily. Okay, so it's a workaround. Gets them back in action without that drastic, time-consuming reinstall. Yes, it's a much more controlled, logical first response. Mm. A safe initial step. Got it. And it illustrates that core troubleshooting idea, doesn't it? Absolutely. Start with the least invasive, most likely fix first. Minimum disruption, maximum chance of restoring function quickly. Makes sense. All right, let's shift gears. Data security, always a hot topic. Imagine a company laptop disappears, lost or stolen. Nightmare scenario. Definitely. How do you make absolutely sure the confidential data on it is useless to whoever finds it? Options are A, BIOS password, B, file compression, C, full disk encryption, D, account lockout policies. Okay, let's break these down. Some are useful security layers, but maybe not for this specific problem. Like the BIOS password? Right. A BIOS password stops someone from booting the OS easily. That's good. But if they just physically remove the hard drive. Ah, uh, the data is still sitting there on the drive. Exactly. Track. Unprotected file compression that just shrinks files. Zero security benefit there. Not at all. And account lockout. Important for stopping brute force login attempts on a running machine? Sure. But if the laptop's off, or again, if they pull the drive, account lockout doesn't do anything to protect the stored data itself. So those options control access in certain ways, but don't scramble the actual data if the physical device is compromised. Correct. Which brings us to option C, full disk encryption. Talk about that. Why is it the robust solution here? So tools like BitLocker in Windows or FileVault on Mac, they encrypt the entire hard drive. Everything. The whole thing. The whole thing. And the magic is, without the right decryption key or password, all that data is just unreadable gibberish 
Complete nonsense. So even if someone gets the drive out? It doesn't matter. They can look at it all they want, but without the key, it's useless. Oh. It renders the data inaccessible and worthless to unauthorized eyes. That's powerful protection against breaches if a device walks off. Okay, so the big aha here is the difference between controlling access to the operating system versus actually protecting the data itself through encryption. Exactly. It really hammers home the need for layered security. Passwords and lockouts are for controlling access during use, but encryption is what secures the data at rest, especially against physical theft or loss. You need the right tool for the specific threat. Precisely. Okay, next up, browser trouble. We've probably all seen this. User says their browser is constantly redirecting to weird sites, pop-ups everywhere. Yeah, the dreaded pop-up storm. Right, so technician's first step. Options, A, run a malware scan, B, clear browser cache. C, reinstall the browser. D, disable browser extensions. Hmm. Well, those symptoms, the redirects, the aggressive pop-ups, they scream malware or adware, don't they? Very classic signs. Yes. So while clearing the cache might fix like a, a minor display glitch. It won't kill malware. No. Yeah. And reinstalling the browser, that can take time. And if the infection is deeper in the system, just reinstalling the browser often will get rid of it. And extensions. Disabling extensions is definitely something to try, you know, later in troubleshooting. Bad extensions can cause problems. Mm. But malware often runs independently. So hitting the extensions first might miss the real culprit. So the priority has to be finding and killing the potential infection. Yes, exactly. Running a thorough, up-to-date malware scan is the most logical initial action here. You need to detect and remove whatever malicious software is causing that chaos. Got it. The key takeaway is recognizing those malware red flags and making detection and removal the first priority. Absolutely. And it just reinforces how crucial it is for you to have good antivirus or anti-malware software installed and kept updated. It's your first line of defense. Okay, slightly different scenario now. You're the tech, you've just finished maintenance on a user's PC, and oops, there's a personal USB drive still plugged in. Ah, the forgotten drive. Yeah. Happens. What's the right way to handle it? Options. A, report it as lost property per company policy. B, poke around the files to see who it belongs to. Risky. C, disconnect it and wipe it clean. Mm -hmm. Or D, just leave it there, close the ticket. Okay, let's think about the problems. Option B, accessing the files. Big privacy no-no. Yeah, you really shouldn't be looking at personal data. It could be legal issues, policy violations. Absolutely. Option C, wiping it. You might be destroying someone's important, maybe irreplaceable data. Huge potential liability there. And just leaving it. Option D. Feels unprofessional, right? Yeah. And doesn't guarantee it gets back to the owner safely. Might violate policy, too. So we need something that respects privacy and follows the rules. Exactly. Option A, reporting it according to company policy, is the professional ethical choice. How does that usually work? Well, most companies have a lost and found procedure. Reporting it creates a proper chain of custody, protects the user's privacy, and maximizes the chance it gets returned securely to the owner. Right, so the aha moment is realizing that professionalism means following policy and ethics, especially with found devices that might contain personal info. It really underscores that data privacy and security protocols aren't just about company data, but also respecting the personal stuff of the users you support. Good point. Okay, let's switch to physical security. Server rooms need to keep unauthorized people out. Which of these is a physical security measure for that? Options. A, BitLocker encryption. B, keycard access. C, password complexity. D, antivirus software. This one's about distinguishing physical from, well, logical or data security. Right. BitLocker encrypts data, right? Doesn't stop someone walking in. Correct. Data security. Password complexity. That's logical access controlling logins. Not physical entry. Antivirus. Or software protection. Against digital threats, not physical ones. So it has to be something that physically blocks entry. Exactly. Key card access. Yeah. That's a direct physical control. You swipe the card, the door unlocks or doesn't if you're not authorized. It physically restricts entry. Simple enough. The inside is just clearly separating physical barriers from digital or data protection methods. Yeah, it shows security is multi-layered. You need the physical locks and the digital locks working together. Makes sense. All right, last scenario. Application troubleshooting. A user says one specific program crashes only when they try to save a file. Everything else works fine. Hmm. Specific issue. Only one app, only on save. What's the tech's first step? Options. A. Verify file permissions in the save location. B. 
run chkdsk on the drive, C, install a different antivirus, D, replace the hard drive. Okay, again, let's think logically. If it's only this one app and only when saving. It probably points to something specific about that app or that action, right? Very likely. Yeah. Running chkdsk checks the whole disk's file system. Useful, maybe, but maybe not the most targeted first step for this specific symptom. Installing more antivirus if other apps are fine. Seems unnecessary and unlikely to fix a saving issue in one program. Yeah. And replacing the hard drive, again, super drastic if everything else is working perfectly. Way overkill. So that leaves option A, checking file permissions where the user's trying to save. Why is that the most likely culprit? Because the application needs permission to write data to that folder. If, for some reason, maybe a weird update, a setting change, group policy, the application doesn't have the necessary write permissions for that specific location, it could easily crash when it tries to perform the save operation. Ah, so the app itself might be fine, but it's being blocked by the operating system's rules for that folder. Exactly. It can't complete the action it's being asked to do. Verifying those permissions is a very common and logical first step for application-specific saving problems. Got it. So the aha is recognizing that specific app behaviors often trace back to specific configurations related to that app, like its permissions, rather than huge system-wide problems. Precisely. It really highlights why understanding OS fundamentals, like how file permissions work, is so important for effective troubleshooting. It's often those basics that solve the puzzle. Definitely. So as you go about your day, dealing with your own tech, maybe at work, maybe just your personal laptop or phone, think about these concepts. How does understanding encryption or permissions or just methodical troubleshooting apply to you? Yeah, it's not just for the pros. Not at all. It's about building that foundation for a smoother, safer, and frankly, much less frustrating digital life for yourself. So maybe think about this. Where's one place in your own tech habits where applying one of these principles could save you a potential headache later on?